Amen. Good morning. All right, Mark 15. We'll start in verse 16 today. We had a shorter passage this week. I just wanted to take a small chunk. Uh, so be thankful, okay? Mark 15. So Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for opportunity, freedom, liberty to gather, to worship, to look at the word of God this morning and apply our minds and our hearts. Would you speak to us? Shape us, mold us. We want to leave this place better disciples of Jesus. It's in your precious name we pray. All God's people said amen. Amen. I've always been struck by this Hebraism or this idiom that's used in the story of the transition from Solomon's power to his, to, uh, to his son. Um, if you remember, the people come to Solomon's son, Rehoboam, in Second Chronicles chapter 10, verse 3 through 11, and they say this. Your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and the heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. Now, Rehoboam is a, is a young ruler, and obviously, anytime there's a, a transition of power, a king dies, the entire kingdom is a little bit um, unstable, right? Like there's turmoil, there's fear, there's anxiety. And so the, the people come to him and they say, look, your father had a heavy hand on us. It was hard, hard work. Would you lighten our load and we'll serve you? And so he's a, he's a young man and he goes to the elders who served with his father, the advisors, and he asked these advisors, what should I say? And the advisors say this, Second Chronicles 10 verse 7, if you will be good to this people and please them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. So the older men with wisdom and gray hair, I've got a little bit, by the way, said this, if you will be kind to the people, they'll serve you. If you will be kind to the people, they will be your servants. But the young man, he then turns from the elders and their wisdom, and he goes to ask his friends, the young men that he grew up with. And so the scripture says, he asked his friends what he should say. And this is what the young men said, without the gray hair, okay? They said this, thus you shall speak to the people who said this to you, your father made our yoke heavy, but you should lighten it for us. Thus you shall say to them, this is the Hebraism, the hair that I like. My little finger is thicker than my father's thigh. My little finger is thicker than my father's thigh. The idea here is um, that the thigh is the strong, the, the glute is the strongest muscle in the body. And so he's saying um, the thigh of my father, of Solomon, the, the, the thigh is the place of stability, the, the place of strength. There are actually recent studies that talk about like, uh, the lifespan, they compare your lifespan with the strength of your legs, but in particular your thighs. And the idea is essentially the longer your thighs are strong and you're mobile, then the longer you live. The, the thighs, again, the place of your stability, place of your mobility. And so the idea is, Rehoboam is saying that my pinky or the weakest muscle is stronger than my father's thigh, that my father's greatest place of strength is weaker than my weakest place. And then his friends say this, tell them my father whipped you with whips, but I'll whip you with scorpions. And so um, Rehoboam in great stupidity listens to the young men and he goes to Israel who they're tired, they're gathered before him and he says, my little finger is stronger than my father's thigh. He whips you with whips, I'll whip you with scorpions. And the scripture says that the kingdom dispersed, that there, this is the introduction of, of Judah and Israel. There being two nations and largely because Rehoboam in his stupidity tries to intimidate people into service. He tries to strong arm Israel to be his servants. He tries to flex his strength and this, in some ways, is the way of worldly leadership to intimidate people, to whip people into submission. But today what we're going to read is we're going to read of a singular king, the only king in all of history who does not say to us, I'll whip you with scorpions, but rather says to us, I will be whipped for you with a cat of nine tails. Again, 
this whip that's braided with bone and metal that tears into the back of Jesus. Rehoboam is the epitome of natural leadership, worldly leadership that says, obey me or else. And Jesus flips that entire thing on his head today and says, I'm going to love you into submission. I'm going to suffer for you, not ask you to suffer for me. I'm not going to whip you. I'm going to be whipped. I'm not going to intimidate you. I am going to love you. And the entirety of the gospel narrative is not this kind of Alexander the Great submit to me or else, but is this watch how much I love you and come and offer yourself freely. He loves us into the kingdom, not beats us into it. So today, as we turn to the scripture, we are reading the epitome of that. This is the moment where Jesus is enduring suffering, enduring harassment, enduring humiliation. He is totally beaten, whipped, tired, exhausted, and he does it all for what? Not to look you in the face and say, obey me or I'll whip you. But he does it all to say, I love you this much. You've never known love like this. You've known men who have put their feet, their heels on your throat. I'll be crushed, crucified, whipped, spit on just to love you. And the intention is that we would read, that we would hear this gospel. The gospel is a declaration. It's news. We would hear this good news that there is a king who does not whip you into submission, but would love you into submission. And the intentionality is that you would hear that good news and come and offer yourself. You're going to serve someone. I'd rather serve the one who really loves me. Now, let me read you the scripture. I spilled my coffee on my notes, and so they're all falling apart. And somehow or another, that's Pastor Brad's fault. Okay, I don't know how, but... Mark 15, starting in verse 16. The soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. They clothed them in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him and they led him out to crucify him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, put his own clothes on him and they led him out to crucify him. Now, I want you to remember where we are in the passion narrative. Okay, so we started in Gethsemane. In Gethsemane, Jesus was praying through the night Remember, he's crying, Father, take this cup from me. The scripture says that he's sweating blood. There's blood leaking from his pores, which shows us that he was sustaining such a fight or flight mode that he was was so anxious, his natural body knew that he should be running, but he didn't. And it's like the equivalent of a, a great anxiety attack, panic attack, like that kind of being strung out emotionally. Jesus stays up under it and the, literally the veins, the, the shallow veins in his skin begin to break. And so blood's dripping from his sweat pores. He's exhausted in Gethsemane. Then he turns from Gethsemane and they take him to the house of Caiaphas, who's the high priest. And at the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, now it's the middle of the night. There's this point where they begin to strike him in the face and spit on him. So, so far, He's had, the, again, the equivalence of like a crazy panic moment. His physical body is shaken. He's tired. It's all the night, through the night. Now he's being punched in the face and spit on. And then we turned from Caiaphas's house and he was taken to Pilate's headquarters where Pilate put him on trial. Remember, he says to the crowd, do you want me to release you Barabbas? And the crowd shouts back, uh, do you want me to release you Jesus? And the crowd shouts back, give us Barabbas. And he says, what do you want me to do with this king of the Jews? And the crowd begins to shout, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate responds, what did he do? And they just shout all the louder, crucify him. And you remember the scripture says that it was then that he was scourged. So now he's been up all night anxiously praying. His body is breaking down. He's spit on and punched, beat in the face by the Jews at Caiaphas's house. And now under Pilate, He's been scourged. Now it's morning time. He hasn't slept. Now under Pilate, he's being scourged. The scourging we talked about last week was, again, what history calls the cat of nine tails. It's this big 
whip with braided in it metal or glass or bone. And he's 39 times whipped in the back. Every time the whip cracks his flesh, the metal or the bone is intended to tear it as the whip is ripped back. And so now imagine he's been up all night, anxiety, panic. He's been beat up, punched in the face. He's got black eyes. Now he's been scourged. His entire back is ripped to pieces. Blood is dripping everywhere. Imagine how you feel when you start to lose blood like that. Like cold and tired and sick. I get sick to my stomach. Like I'm going to throw up. Nauseous. How many times as he steps now, does, you know, do his eyes go red and he kind of spins? And from here, the scripture tells us that the guards now take him to the governor's headquarters. So he's transitioned from under Jewish leadership, he was spit on and punched. Under Pilate, he was scourged. And now the guards have him and they've taken him to the headquarters of the governor. They're most likely outside in a courtyard. And we have this change of scenery and we have a change of audience. Now Jesus is before a battalion of soldiers. We know that that's like roughly one, one tenth of the largest measure. It's basically 600 people. There are 600 soldiers surrounding Jesus now who is exhausted, bloody, emotional, sick to his stomach. And the guards, the, the soldiers now surround him. And it's as if you get this like, for lack of better words, like pile of testosterone, like these men puffing out their chest, like trying to prove something, trying to assert their masculinity over this bloody, tired, exhausted man. And many commentators point out, and I think it's interesting to think that most of these men would have grown up in gladiator culture, okay? So they would have thought about um, men standing for beasts and lions, and they've seen a lot of death, a lot of brutal death. Because for me, if you put a man before me who's been up all night and is bleeding out and his flesh is torn, his back is breaking apart, I don't want to touch that man. I'm probably going to vomit. But these 600 soldiers, it's like they smell blood and now they're excited. There's this bloodlust that they've really carried. And so they bring him, he's surrounded by 600 people and they begin this kind of show. Okay, so they're going to find, the scripture says, a purple cloak and wrap it around him. Some commentators suggest that it was just an old piece of cloth that a soldier had, or it could have been even a carpet, like a rug that was laid out somewhere in the governor's palace. Either way, Jesus is bloody, open wound back, is now clothed with a purple robe. Imagine the feeling of some nasty cloth, heavy cloth, sitting on your shoulders that are totally open. So, that, But they're dressing him. This is, this is like a harassment. They're, they're dressing him to play a part. They're, they're, they're enjoying themselves. They're, they're, these are bored soldiers entertaining themselves. And so now they make a crown of thorns. Now, that's kind of an interesting concept to us, but imagine a, like a Greek Olympian, what they would wear. You know what I'm talking about? Like the, the wreath around their head. It's like they've made a, an Olympian's wreath, but they made it out of thorns as a symbol of death. And of course, to like cut him, of course, to hurt. So they, they, they braid together this, this bundle of thorns to look like an Olympian's wreath and they, or, or a king's wreath and they place it upon his head. And the interesting point is that Jesus kind of allows for the show, for the spectacle. He is the center of their pleasure right now. This this is a masquerading. Uh, and Jesus just kind of silently endures it. Again, sick to his stomach. I think probably fighting for his balance at times. His eyes are bloodshot and flushed. And he just kind of silently endures all of their harassment. He doesn't protest, but he kind of silently submits to their ridicule. They're taunting him mocking him, and he just holds steady. He's absolutely the butt of the joke. He is the laughing stock. 
And it's, it's just pure evil, pure human evil. Like this isn't a punishment. This isn't a, this isn't a part of his judgment. This is just pure evil in humanity wanting to see someone else suffer and to laugh about it. I was reading the scripture and, and thinking this week and imagining the soldier who found the purple robe and kind of giddily chuckling as he brings it. Let's put this on him. And, and someone having the, the, the malicious evil thought. You know what I could do is I could braid thorns to look like a crown. Wouldn't that be funny? And this is a manifestation of human depravity, evil. And Jesus just endures it. He just endures all of the harassment. So then they began to salute him and they start to declare him king. Now they're mocking, okay? They're, they're in every way trying to humiliate him. And the idea here is that they're carrying this kind of angst in their soul, this kind of, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are, Jesus, that we would ever bow to you? So, so they're mocking him. They're, 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 they're responding how they would have responded if Caesar came in the room. They're kneeling and saluting and laughing. And of course, Jesus is much more than Caesar. Jesus is the prince of heaven. Angels shudder and fall before him. But he just kind of bears up under all of the humiliation. Humiliation, technically speaking, is the concept that someone in some way, out, someone degrades your worth or devalues you, that you, you are a person of status or dignity, but someone begins to treat you as if you're garbage or, or trash or less than. And so in every way, Jesus is being treated as if he's the scum of the earth. Never mind the fact that he's the creator of heaven, the prince of heaven. He's being treated as the scum of the earth and he just endures. He just listens as they make fun of him, as they mock him, as they jest, he just stands and takes it. One commentator made this point and it's incredibly significant. That this, imagine again, like try to get this picture in your mind with me. Jesus bloody, incredibly bloody, dizzy, sick, with a crown of thorns on his head and a purple robe sitting over his open wounds and men falling before him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Hail, King of the Jews. And one commentator put it this way. He said, this is the photo negative of what we call the Carmen Christi. The Carmen Christi, that just means the hymn of Christ we find in Philippians chapter two. And you remember Philippians chapter two, nine says this. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. The idea here is that there's a coming hour when all of creation will bow before him. And even the most evil of men, even the most rebellious of men, even the most God awful of men will confess with their lips that Jesus is Lord to the glory of of the Father. There's an hour in which these men will have to bow and confess, you are master, you are sovereign, you are glorious. But this is, again, the photo negative. This is the antithesis of that moment. This is Jesus being treated as the scum of the earth with a crown of thorns and a bloody purple robe and Roman soldiers doing everything they can to humiliate him. They're just trying to humiliate him. Jesus wears the humiliation. He doesn't argue back. He doesn't bicker. He doesn't try to make a good point. He just wears the humiliation. Now, from here, they began to torture his already tortured body. Okay, this body's had enough. It doesn't need any more violence cast upon it. It's, it's, it's good. They began to torture his already tortured torture body. They spit on his face for the second time. This is the second time Jesus has been spit on. And this is actually an interesting point to try to ponder for a while. Obviously spit in the Mosaic law is unclean. And I was, I was looking to the scripture, trying to think about instances of spitting and like where we get that idea of like spitting on someone to insult them. 
And I, I remembered or came across this passage. Do you remember when Miriam um, is gossiping about Moses? She's kind of um, rebelling against Moses's leadership and she gets leprosy. And Jesus, uh, Jesus, Moses prays for her. And part of her judgment from the father was that her father, uh, was, was that someone should spit in her face and she should be unclean for seven days. So Miriam, part of her judgment is it to be spit on. And that's interesting because it's such, a, it's such a humiliating judgment, such a sign of being an outcast. And now here Jesus is, the greater Moses, by the way, being spit on. And if you can imagine how much blood and sweat and open wounds, like I just don't want your spit in my open wounds. There's this, there's this filth to it, right? There's a filthiness to what's taking place. Then they begin to strike him on the head, the scripture says, with reeds. Okay, the idea here is not like what you see in the marsh, like the flimsy cattails, whatever those things are called. The idea here is like a, a slender but thick rod. And they begin to, now imagine him, sick to his stomach already, cold, shaking, tired, they're beating him in the face with a rod. And it's like, how much can a body endure? How close is he to, to passing out? How close is he to blacking out? And he just takes another strike. And there's, there's some connotation that the crown of thorns on his head, as they hit him with a rod, that his skull is kind of being pierced, scratched and cut. And you imagine all the different kinds of wounds that he's experiencing, like blunt force, open wounds on his back, being scraped by this crown of thorns. It's like from every angle, his body is feeling excruciating pain and he just takes it. He doesn't stop it. Again, the concept, biblically speaking, is that at any moment, Jesus could have stopped it all. We said last week, if Elijah can call down fire, Jesus can call down fire. He could have at any moment said, enough! but he just allows them to beat him in the face again. And I imagine this week as I was reading this, oh, this is such a, such not strong enough an analogy. But you ever, um, if you ever decide that you're gonna get, you're gonna get fit and you're gonna start running, um, this is not for you guys who are fit. You're not gonna understand this analogy. For the rest of us, we get about a quarter of a mile in and we start having to self-talk. Okay, so I'm trying to coach myself, right? You can do this. One more step. For me, I get about three quarters of a mile and I start saying, no, I can't. Somebody take me to Buffalo Wild Wings. This is enough. But I imagine Jesus being struck and again, nauseous and sick and trying to self-talk like having to pick himself back up and a little further, a little further. It's worth it. It's going to be worth it. And the idea of what we call the, the, the hypostatic union, the idea that his deity and humanity are, are totally fused. Like he's, he's both, he's God and man in this moment. There, there, you can just assume that there's a, a part of him that, that maybe is struck and like, wants to pop back, but he settles himself a little further, a little further. And you have to begin to question why, like what's under that? What is under Jesus allowing men to strike him in the face with a rod? What is under that? And I imagine the sound of it, the, the crack of a rod across his skull. And the only thing you're left with when you read it and you ponder and you consider the entirety of the biblical narrative, the only thing you're left with is that he really loved us. The only thing you're left with is he wanted us. The scripture says that they, they put his 
they take off the purple robe, the, the kind of shenanigan, the charade is done, and they put his robe back on him. And there's some implication, commentators say, that at this point, he is close enough to death that they don't want to hit him anymore. They, they don't want to continue the abuse because they're worried that he's already going to die. So they put the robe back on, lead him to the cross. This is where he's going to be given the cross and the coming passage. So when we circle back and we just go, if this is the most important account of all of history, this is the most significant historical event. And we want to really think it through well and try to imagine the scene We're left to ponder it. And again, I, I go like, this isn't Rehoboam saying, I'm going to whip you with scorpions. This is Jesus saying, give me your best. And in many ways, that's what he's doing. Give me your best. How much violence you got in you? You want to whip me a little harder? Get your cat of nine tails out. You want to beat me with a rod? You want to spit in my face? You want to rub my open wounds? Give me your best. And here we go from the violence of Jewish leadership to the violence of Pilate to the violence of these gladiator-esque Roman soldiers beating, striking, cussing, spitting, mocking, humiliating. And it's as if Jesus goes, keep, keep it coming, baby. How much do you want to see me endure? Give me your best. And all of humanity spews wrath and wickedness and humiliation upon him. And the church for 2,000 years now has read these stories. We've thought about this narrative. And our response has been, I have never been loved like this. That is the proper response of Christianity. The only way to really read the story, think about the story, encounter the Christ of the story is to rise up in your heart and just say, I have never been loved like this. And he doesn't whip me into his kingdom. He loves me into his kingdom. And the church is able to persevere. The church is able to, to get up and serve the poor, is able to run to every national natural disaster, the church keeps pushing forward because the church is motivated by this revelation that there is no such thing in all of creation as this kind of love. This is a uniquely beautiful, profound kind of love that Jesus displays for us. He endures the humiliation. He stands up during the harassment. He looks all the pain in the face and says, keep bringing it, baby. How much more could you pour on me? I'll take it for them. I'll take it for them. It leaves us to adore him. Because he loves us into the kingdom and doesn't strong us, arm us into the kingdom, love and thankfulness fill the church's entire atmosphere, ethos, we're not Christians because we're scared of hell. We're Christians because we've seen Christ endure hell. We're not Christians again because we want blessings. We're Christians because we have blessings in the person of Christ. We're not Christians because we want spiritual authority or we want to somehow establish ourselves as the greater. We're Christians because we've seen the man who wore all shame, humiliation, violence. And that, that image, that picture, listen to me say this, and I'll start winding down. It's intended to break you, to break you. Again, he doesn't whip me into the kingdom. He breaks me into it. When I see an image or my mind recalls the bloody Jesus crucified for me, my heart is broken. And I, and I can get myself to this place of, 
Eight kids is nothing, baby. Get up and go to work and serve. I can do this for you. Evangelize, pray for the sick, care for the hungry. I'll do it for you. I'll keep showing up the small group for you. Like everything in the Christian life begins to flow from this response to the cross. If your Christian life is trying to earn something or prove something to yourself, trying to prove to yourself that you're valuable or that you're worthy or that you can be disciplined, you missed it. Your Christian life must be a response to this. Like I've, I've just seen in the narrative of Christ's passion, such love that I can't go back. And that drives me. And the church that's trying to earn or prove or trying to look more spiritual than the next is soon to fall short, soon to crumble and fold and cave because you all fight and bicker with yourselves. But a church that's looked at the blood of Jesus and the wounds of Jesus and the passion of Jesus and just responds with, that changes everything. That's the church God will use. And in some way, in some way, our effectiveness in this region is directly derived from whether or not we've really pondered his passion. Our fruitfulness in the days to come, it correlates directly with whether or not we've really seen him in his suffering, been broken by his passion, And I want to encourage you today, Seth, you can come. Hear it, consider it, and respond to this. Jesus abused, humiliated, beaten for you. And then when the enemy comes and says, you're not good enough or you, you're awful or why did you do that? Why? You just respond with, no, he loves me. When discouragement comes, I get it. I'm not perfect. My life is messy. I'm tired. But I know one stinking thing to be true. That man loves me. And the entire response of my life flows from this, right? Like, again, not perfect. Don't always handle every situation appropriately. But one thing remains. Jesus Christ loves me. And that is all, literally all all that matters. Get there. If you stand to your feet, we'll get ready to close. Altar team, if you, if you just kind of hang out in place, I think the first thing, I'm, maybe the primary thing I want to say is that I think there are some of us in the room that have struggled in the past to really receive the fact that Jesus loves you. You question God's love for you and you live feeling unworthy. And today, as we sing, what we're gonna do is just sing for a moment. We're not gonna hang out forever. We're gonna sing for a moment. If that's you and you know it, you know that you doubt God's love for you. You know that there've been these thoughts of like, maybe you're not good enough. I wanna encourage you to come and, and maybe kneel or ask someone to lay hands on you. And what we're gonna do this morning is we're gonna allow this story to wash over all of those doubts and all of that condemning voice and the, the am I enough narrative. It's not about, are you enough? It's about what he did. And the, the measure of violence that he endured for you is unfathomable. He just loves you. So the primary thing I wanna do today is I want us to sing. And if you're struggling to feel loved, I want you to come and we're gonna ask God just to wash you in the love of Jesus today. Secondly, if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, I want you to come. Just grab one of these people standing up front's hand and say, can you tell me more about Jesus? i will know exactly how to pray with you. If you have any other need, you're just kind of an emotional or spiritual crisis, I want you to come as we sing. And we'd love to pray for you. Church, let's respond to this with worship today.